Mr. President, we're nearing the halfway point of the 117th Congress, and it's time to uh, look back and see what our Democratic colleagues now in the majority have accomplished. Unfortunately, we've seen a lot of wasted valuable time, ig ignoring of critical tasks and failing to meet some of the most basic requirements of governing. Our colleagues used the first few months of the year to ram through a partisan $2 trillion spending bill. And then they wasted the summer on the majority leaders designed to fail agenda. It wasn't about actually getting anything done, it was about messaging. And then they threw, threw it in cruise control this fall, refusing to let the Senate vote on anything other than low-level nominees and, again, those messaging bills. Well, unsurprisingly, this partisan approach to governing, despite the fact that we have an evenly divided Senate and perhaps even an evenly divided government, this partisan approach, unsurprisingly, did not lead to great results. One of the biggest unforced errors in this tardiness so far has been the National Defense Authorization Bill. Now, I, uh, I happen to believe that providing for the common defense and supporting our men and women in the military, keeping the American people safe, protecting our freedoms is the most important work that we do here. And indeed, that's reflected by the fact that the National Defense Authorization Act has been passed 60 years, I believe it is, 60 consecutive years. Well, this is not a particularly controversial bill. In fact, it came out of the Armed Services Committee with an impressive 23 to 3 vote. And you have to look long and hard to find any bill that passes the Senate that enjoys as much bipartisan support. For some unknown reason, though, the Democratic leader refused to bring the defense authorization bill to the floor. But then when he finally did, after he'd been sitting around waiting for action for literally months, then he attached a controversial provision, a bill, the uh, so-called um, Endless Frontiers Act, which had not been processed by the House, but an attempt to force the House to take that bill. Well, as it turned out, after a broad bipartisan support for the defense authorization bill, he couldn't get the votes here in the Senate to advance that bill, so he had to basically pull it down. Well, when you try to add something as big as the Endless Frontiers bill that did pass the Senate to a bipartisan defense appropriation bill, that created a lot of problems. So you can't sit on a bill for months and then at the last moment try to jam another bill onto it without at least giving people an opportunity for a robust debate and amendment process. And as we know, unfortunately, during the time I've been here, and I'm sure during the time the presiding officer's been here, we have less and less of that robust debate and less and less of actually offering and voting on amendments on the Senate floor. It's very different from the time I came here when that was commonplace. So I, I am disappointed that it's taken the leader this long to bring the NDAA to the floor, and that so far we've been, we've been thwarted in our attempt to get this bipartisan bill done. I, I hear rumors that, in fact, there may be a uh, bill being pre-conferenced with the House, so it, um, my hope is that we'll get a chance to vote on this bill in the coming days. Of course, as I indicated, this legislation uh, sends critical support to our service members and their families and ensures that our military bases in Texas and Connecticut and elsewhere have the funding they need to support the missions uh, they serve in around the world. But it also provides the military the means to take stock in the global threat landscape. Since 9-11, we've been very focused on the terrorism threat Unfortunately, at the same time, we've seen China and Russia uh, continue to assert themselves more aggressively around the world. And so now we are in the so-called great powers competition once again. And it's critical that we have this, this tool uh, known as deterrence that only comes through strength. And uh, passing this bill and providing the resources and the authorities needed for our military 
are essential to providing that strength which will lead, hopefully, to deterrence and greater peace. So the NDAA, as I said, is one of the most important assignments that we've had, and there's simply no excuse for leaving this in the cleanup pile uh, to be done between now and Christmas. But having said that, I hope we do, we, do, uh, we do get it done. As I said, there's other past due assignments, something as basic as funding the function of the government through passing 12 separate appropriations bills um, that pe go through a committee process, uh, are open to amendment in the committee. Uh, Congress's deadline to pass the funding bills doesn't pop up out of nowhere. It hits the same day every year. Back in September, when the Senate should have passed a group of those appropriation bills to fund the government for the next fiscal year, our colleagues on the other side, led by the Democratic leader, kicked the can down the road for two months. Rather than use that time to play catch up and pass those annual appropriation bills, they simply lollygagged. The funding deadline came last week, and what happened? Well, it was another continuing resolution. They kicked the can down the road yet once again. This year, our colleagues have found the time to vote on partisan dead on arrival messaging bills, but they have yet to bring a single appropriations bill to the floor for a vote. We'll see if that changes before February when the current continuing resolution runs out. Then there's another assignment that our colleagues have ignored for months, and that is the debt ceiling. While they're more than happy to spend money like they did at the first part of this year, another $2 trillion, and add to the national debt, and plan to spend at least another anywhere from uh, probably close to $4.5 trillion additional more money on the Build Back Better program. I know it's been advertised at $1.7 trillion, but outside, outside uh, entities like the Wharton Business School at the University of Pennsylvania had said, uh, if you ignore the stop and starts that are set up in the bill as gimmicks to make it score less, and if you actually extend the bill for the full 10-year budget window, it really is spending closer to $4.8 trillion. Uh, we're trying to get the Congressional Budget Office and the uh, Joint Tax uh, Joint Committee on Taxation to give us a realistic score. But if you see this uh, two trillion spent at the beginning of the year with another anticipated potential up to four and a half, four point eight, five trillion dollars, uh, you can see why raising the debt limit is so uh, so critical. The Treasury Secretary said that uh, we will hit the debt limit by December the 15th, just a week from tomorrow. Again, this crisis did not just pop up out of nowhere. Since July, the Republican leader has told our friends across the aisle that they need to raise the debt ceiling on their own. Now, some have asked, why is it that we insist that Democrats raise the debt ceiling on their own when ordinarily this is a bipartisan effort? Well, part of this is just a necessary political accountability. If our colleagues are going to spend trillions of dollars in borrowed money and add to the debt ceiling, at some point there has to be some transparency and electoral accountability. And uh, I'm told now that uh, Senator Schumer and Senator McConnell have agreed on a process that will allow our Democratic colleagues to fulfill their responsibility to, to raise the debt ceiling on their own and, and suffer the accountability the, that goes along with it. Uh, all along, there was a clear roadmap that could have avoided this confusion if our colleagues had simply used the budget reconciliation process. Debt ceilings are routinely uh, raised using the reconciliation process. There's no problem with the bird bath or any other, uh, any other concerns. Uh, it's something that is written into the Budget Act of 1974 that they could have done on their own earlier. But by delaying here to the last minute, where Secretary Yellen says we're going to hit the debt ceiling here by the 15th of December, they've created another crisis, again, of their own making. The reason our colleagues have essentially failed at the fundamentals of governing over this last year is because they've been distracted by their own partisan ambitions. 
again, you would think in a, after the election in 2020, when you have an evenly divided Senate, where the vice president is the one that breaks ties and actually determines because of that, who's in the majority and who's in the minority, that would counsel some bipartisan consensus making, um, where, where the Senate split essentially evenly. Instead, we've seen one of the most aggressive radical agendas that we've seen since I've been in the Senate. Uh, and not surprisingly, our Democratic colleagues have had trouble convincing even members of their own caucus uh, to go along with it. The Build Back Better program, or what I would call Build Back Bankrupt, uh, is a bill that gives millionaires and billionaires massive tax breaks, strangely from the party who claims to be representing the working class and middle class of the country, they want to prioritize the tax breaks for millionaires and billionaires while forcing middle class families who can't afford to buy expensive electric cars to subsidize these fancy cars uh, driven by others who can't afford them. Our colleagues say this spending spree will cost the taxpayers about $2 trillion, which of course is hardly a bargain to begin with. I remember when a billion dollars used to be a lot of money around here. Uh, and now they, trillions of dollars is casually tossed around like it's uh, insignificant or not as uh, serious a matter as it is. But we know the spending spree, as I said, the build back bankrupt or build back broke, whatever you want to call it, build back bad. Uh, there's other names you could give it. Uh, but it could cost as much as $5 trillion, as I said, more than two and a half times what has been advertised. We started at $6 trillion from the chairman of the Budget Committee, Senator Sanders. Then it was pared down supposedly to $3.5 trillion and then to $1.75 trillion. But the only way that was done is to, is to uh, propose a piece of legislation that's chock full of gimmicks and cliffs and phony false starts in bills, in uh, programs that will in all likelihood be uh, continued should our Democratic colleagues stay uh, in a majority or, or achieve a true majority. This multi-trillion dollar bill will drive up energy costs. We've already seen inflation eating away at the income of working families. When you go fill up your gas tank at the gas station, when you uh, let, sit down to Thanksgiving dinner, everything is more expensive now because of inflation, making it even tougher for Texas families, among others, to make ends meet. And of course, then there's the president falsely representing the cost of this piece of legislation, actually saying, having the temerity to say, uh, this costs zero. I don't know what he takes the American people for, but they're not stupid. They understand that when somebody stands up there and says, we're going to do something that's been scored at uh, trillions of dollars and it's going to cost zero, it really is an insult to their intelligence. For the past several months, our colleagues have devoted almost all of their energy to this build back bankrupt plan. And of course, in the process, fa failed to meet any of the most basic responsibilities of governing. But now that it's finals season, uh, we're running out of time before the Christmas holidays. They're trying to salvage uh, their poor performance of accomplishment uh, this year. Our colleagues are quick to point the famer, finger and blame Republicans for the Senate's failures, but Republicans aren't the ones setting the schedule. And frankly, the message being sent from the Democratic side of this aisle is we don't want to work with Republicans. We want to do this all by ourselves. And uh, if they get the votes, they can. Uh, but they are having some difficulties now, particularly on the Build Back Broke plan of even getting Democrats to vote for it. And I actually think our colleagues from West Virginia and Arizona are doing some of their Democratic colleagues a, friend, uh, a, a favor, um, because I dare say there's other members of the Democratic caucus who are going to be on the ballot in 2022 that would prefer not to vote on some of these very controversial uh, provisions. Our colleagues, though, do control the Senate, the House, and the White House, and every aspect of the legislative process is under their control. So they bear responsibility for the delay 
in the defense authorization bill. Um, they bear responsibility for not passing uh, regular appropriations, and they bear responsibility for the concerns that have been expressed by uh, reaching the debt limit, as Secretary Yellen has said. And then finally, um, by trying to pass through the House this reckless tax and spending spree bill, build back better, build back broke, build back bankrupt, um, by focusing so much on these pieces of legislation that will, in my estimation, never pass, or certainly not in their current form, and ignoring their other basic responsibilities of governing, they're the ones who ultimately uh, get this uh, report card uh, for their performance during the first year of their majority. So presented with this uh, reality of an evenly split Congress, um, our colleagues can make a choice whether to try to work together and build consensus and do things that can actually pass or continue down this pathway of purely partisan uh, attempts to legislate. The choice is theirs. Mr. President, I yield the floor.